going to get started, so if you could please take your seat. It's 10 seconds to noon. Uh, welcome to the first, the second afternoon speaker session here at Skyscapes. It's really wonderful for us all to be back together again. Um, just a few quick announcements. If you don't know the library, the restrooms are along the west wall. There's an emergency exit down the east side, although God knows you probably don't need it. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge for the afternoon that this beautiful library in the city of Boulder is on the ancestral land and territories of numerous indigenous people. It was unseated, so we are here at their grace. These include the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Ute, the Shoshone, the Pawnee, the Apache, um, and the Sioux. And this was their land. So, uh, without much further ado, our next session is called A Matter of Trust. And this is the name of a book by Minakshi, who is one of our speakers. Minakshi Ahmed, A Matter of Trust. The Boulder Bookstore was not able to get these books in stock for today, but they are on sale at Amazon. So, and they're, and they're on there. They're on their way, so who knows, they might show up today. So um, without much further ado, I would like to introduce Sima, who is going to then conduct a talk with our guests, Minakshi and Ken Just. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and a big welcome to you all. Um, let's. Uh, let's begin. We have with us Minakshi Ahmed, uh, the author of a very important book uh, called A Matter of Trust, India-U.S. Relations from Truman to Trump. And it's a privilege to uh, welcome Ambassador Ken Juster. He served as the U.S. Ambassador to India during the Trump administration. And more importantly, he's been involved in U.S.-India matters for more than two decades. Um, let me begin by saying, Meena, that I really enjoyed the book, uh, so much so that I read it twice. Uh, the book is comprehensive. It gives you a real sense of the ups and downs, the highs and the lows, the good and the bad, and how difficult uh, it can be for two uh, complex democracies to try to sort the issues, whether it's the big geopolitical issues or the smaller quid pro quo issues. Uh, the book covers vast ground. Uh, it traces the arc of U.S.-India relations from the time of India's independence in 1947 uh, to the present. And Minakshi tells the story mainly through personalities uh, and their peculiar angularities. Uh, that's what makes it interesting. Um, in other words, it's not uh, a dense book filled with academic jargon. Uh, no offense to academics in the audience. Um, but uh, so let's begin. I think we can all agree uh, that the world is in a flux. The old order is under stress, and a new superpower, namely China, uh, is itching to displace the United States. Uh, the great power competition has increased India's strategic importance in US eyes, um, and the two democracies are increasingly aligned to manage uh, the China challenge. That said, uh, it's taken a very long, tortuous road to get here. Uh, let's find out why uh, the road was so difficult. Uh, Minakshi, tell us uh, about U.S. presidents who, in your view, uh, were the most influential in um, the history of Indo-U.S. relations. Thank you so much for this opportunity to the Jaipur Literary Festival. Um, 
It's a real pleasure to be here in Boulder. So thank you so much for all the organizers, first of all. Uh, thank you for having me here. And um, it's truly an honor to share the stage with Ambassador Ken Justa, um, not just because um, he was ambassador to India, but I would like to uh, point out that he was actually um, an incredibly critical player in terms of uh, turning the relationship around. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd just like to say at the outset, I'm a Democrat, and I had no intention to make Republicans the hero of my book. But um, the story, in, its, in, its, in a way, has to tell itself. The facts have to lead the way. And um, as Seema so rightly pointed out, um, and I'm so grateful that she you know, really did her research and her homework. Um, she's a really excellent journalist. Um, she, um, you know, the, the relationship had a lot of ups and downs um, from, from the get-go, and I'll explain why. But uh, for the first 50 years uh, of the U.S.-India relationship, it was a rather prickly relationship, even though the U.S. was the world's most powerful democracy and India was the world's largest democracy. Um, India became independent just as um, colonialism was in retreat, and the world, unfortunately for India, was... Um, entering the Cold War. So um, the, the world had polarized into two spheres, um, and it was the communist world versus the world, uh, the de democratic world led by the United States. And there was this attitude in the West that you're either with us or against us. Um, India, which had just come out of the yoke of colonialism, really didn't want to now line itself up with another Western power, having just obtained freedom. So they wanted to remain neutral. Uh, Truman, who was not quite the worldly man that Roosevelt was, um, if you recall, uh, President Roosevelt had only allowed Truman into one foreign policy meeting during his entire tenure as vice president. He had shut Truman out. So Truman had to learn very quickly when President Roosevelt died suddenly, um, you know, of, of a stroke. And so uh, he, 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 he wasn't focused on India and Asia. He was really focused on, on Europe. And and his attitude was, you're either with us or against us. And if you weren't willing to sign up with the US and, and uh, Europe, you basically, he, he did not view neutrality as, as a positive thing. He did not understand neutrality, and he did not appreciate it. Uh, so Nehru had a pretty tough job uh, in terms of his relations with, with the U.S. at the time, even though India had committed itself to being a democracy. So, so there in a capsule was um, the state of conflict between the two countries right there. Um, it, it, it would then um, bleed into the next couple of administrations, and I, I, can, I can get into that. But what I will say is that um, let's fast forward 50 years, and it really took President H.W. Bush, who changed the relationship around dramatically, and, and um, Ambassador Justa was a part of that. And it continued under President Trump. And these, the, he is the first president. President H.W. Bush is the, is the president. Well, Clinton set the foundations, but he wasn't able to actually do much in his term in office um, because he was really caught up with a lot of other issues uh, which we can get into. But um, President Bush is the one who said, what do we need to do to get this relationship on track? China's a rising threat. 
Um, India is now, has emerged as a global power because economically India had undertaken these massive economic reforms in the 90s and it was no longer the nation that was out with a begging bowl asking for foreign aid, it was now a, a global power. So that had put it on the map and it had become um, an ally that was desirable. There was a rising um, diaspora in this country that was, uh, had become increasingly vocal and effective. So um, India was now becoming an attractive ally. And he was the first president to say, what do they want? And what India wanted was to be respected as a responsible nuclear power. Ken was amongst the first team. He was a, he was a member of the very first team with Steve Hadley that went out to start the process of making, recognizing India as a responsible nuclear power and starting this whole process of the nuclear deal. And so, um, Am Ambassador Justa, you were part of that process and you can tell us all the details, but it's almost like a thriller, it's, as maybe Seema can tell you, that there were many ups and downs um, in this whole negotiation, and there were times when you know, the Americans walked out at midnight and there were times when the negotiations sank to real lows and the Indians just walked out and said, we can't do this, the Americans are impossible, we can't trust them, but in the end it happened. And it was, uh, that's why the book is called A Matter of Trust. It was a matter of building up the trust and wiping out years of suspicion that had built up and and uh, things worked out in the end. And today we have a relationship that is, is now we're considered, we're not treaty allies in the formal sense, but we are pretty strong allies. So I'll turn it back to you. So I remember those days so well. Um, President George uh, W. Bush, he asked his, um, you know, cohorts, his advisors, why don't we get along better? You know, why are these two democracies uh, so opposed to each other? Why aren't we better friends? And uh, he was pretty close to some of the Indian Americans in, uh, in his area in Texas and in Florida. Um, and that's how it all began. And then his advisors were very far-sighted, I would say, especially Condi Rice um, and Philip Zelikov. Uh, so anyway, uh, should we move to Ambassador Justa to ask how uh, the you know, whole thing came about? You were there at the very beginning when the relationship was changing. You were in the Commerce Department. You started some of those things. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here for the Jaipur Literature Festival and to be on a panel with uh, Seema and with Mina. Uh, I've had the privilege of participating in the festival in Jaipur, virtually in New York, and now uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and I also have uh, enjoyed tremendously Mina's book, and it gives you, a very, in a very readable way, uh, the ups and downs in the history of the relationship. And as uh, both Seema and Mina have mentioned, it was really in about the year 2000 that we began what I believe was the transformation of the U.S.-India relationship from one that had been largely cool with some positives and negatives during the Cold War, uh, but turned around shortly after India's nuclear tests in 1998. The United States had put sanctions on India, but President Clinton had long wanted to travel there. He had a great interest in India from his days in uh, Oxford University. And he did go at the, toward the end of his term in the year 2000, and it lent tremendous goodwill. It was the first president to travel to India in several administrations. Uh, but they were not able to overcome some of the nuclear issues that existed as a result of the tests. And George W. Bush came into office and had the very simple notion that the world's oldest democracy, the United States, and its largest democracy, India should get together get along better together, and that India, with its growing economy, uh, was going to play an important role in Asia, in South Asia, and in the broader uh, Asian region, and the United States should have a good relationship with it. A strong India and a strong U.S.-India relations were in U.S. interest. And that was, uh, as uh, Mina has said in her book, the tone at the top is important in terms of what happens uh, on the ground, 
and then there were other officials who helped implement that vision. India really wanted access to U.S. technology that could help its civil nuclear industry and that could get it off the sanctions list. And my role at the time, I was under Secretary of Commerce in charge of all of our sensitive technology, so I was involved in this uh, transformation. And what we first tried to do was create just a dialogue on high technology. And uh, I, along with India's Foreign Secretary at the time, Conwell Sibyl, created the High Technology Cooperation Group, which began to discuss ways that the United States could transfer sensitive technology to India, could take Indian entities off of our sanctions list, but at the same time, India could put in place controls to be able to tell the United States where that technology was, how it was being used, to verify it was being used for the right purpose, and to make sure it didn't leak out to third parties that weren't supposed to get access to that technology. We began with a lot of mutual suspicion and uncertainty, and the relationship was sort of stiff, but the dialogue really worked effectively, and because of that, we then began a new initiative. Steve Hadley, who was the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, and myself flew to India to meet with them and launched something called the Next Steps in Strategic Partnership, which covered high technology, civil uh, nuclear issues, civil space issues, and missile defense. And again, it was sort of a roadmap as to how we could increase our cooperation and bring down some of the barriers that had existed in the relationship. Nothing happens smoothly, and there were uh, difficult negotiations through it. And in fact, uh, at that time, uh, one of the key players on the Indian side is now the foreign minister, uh, Jay Shankar, who was uh, the Joint Secretary for the Americas. Another important player was the Foreign Secretary, Sham Saran. And we negotiated successfully the first stages of this next steps in strategic partnership. And only at that point did we really have the confidence to contemplate a civil nuclear deal. That was not something that we thought about at the outset. We had these discrete uh, other foundational steps that really provided the confidence building measures to then in the second term of the Bush administration, and the name Phil Zellico was mentioned was an important player, uh, come up with the, civil the framework for a civil nuclear deal that was agreed to at the last minute in 2005. Prime Minister Singh came to the United States and the deal was not uh, going to be concluded. They negotiated. It fell apart. Uh, the president and the prime minister were to meet the next morning. Condi Rice woke up in the middle of the night saying, I've got to make a last-ditch effort to make this work. She f really uh, urged the prime minister to meet. They got together and they worked out the final issues. And President Bush was always there to say, let me push this forward. Let me put aside some of the bureaucratic concerns because there was not a full consensus in either government that this relationship should be moving as rapidly and in the transformative way that it was. You had, uh, and we'll get to this later, I assume, uh, people in India that were very suspicious of the United States because of sanctions in the past that the U.S. had put on India, because of a feeling that Russia was a much more reliable partner. There were people in the United States who were against the proliferation of technology that might enable India to increase its nuclear capabilities. And so you had to deal with these challenges. And ultimately, in my view, not only were the leaders important, but over the last 20 years, there's been a cadre of people at the sub-leadership level that have been necessary to help push through some of these bureaucratic barriers along the way. The relationship has improved tremendously uh, to the point that we are very close strategic partners now, but it didn't go in a smooth way. It's sort of gone in fits and starts. I sometimes say day to day it can be challenging, but when you step back and look at what we've accomplished over the last 20 years, it's been remarkable. And today we deal on every issue in human endeavor, from defense to counterterrorism to nonproliferation to trade, investment, energy, the environment, science and technology, space, oceans, education, agriculture, and many more. We don't always see eye to eye on it, but we are engaged at every level, 
and it really is a partnership that has withstood changes of government in both countries and is one of the few issues today in Washington that there's a bipartisan uh, consensus on. So it's been gratifying to be part of that, but there are still issues and challenges uh, going forward. Absolutely. Uh, there are many can I, issues. Can I just interrupt for one little second? I'll just give you a small anecdote to give you a flavor of some of these negotiations. So they had met in different countries, different occasions, hundreds of meetings, and they thought they'd come to a deal, right? So they come to India, the, the US team, and Anil Kakodkar, who was a head of the Indian Nuclear Commission, all of a sudden decides he can't go through with it. He says the Americans are unreliable, and he raises all these red flags and basically kills the deal. So Gandhi Rice comes in, she is absolutely furious, and she goes, if the Indians want to stay in the nuclear ghetto, let them. She said she's so totally fed up. She said she's had it, everyone's tired, and she said, you know what, I'm going to sleep, and if they don't want this deal, so be it. And she goes to sleep, and she's had it with them, and then she wakes up at five in the morning, and she says, no, we work too hard, we can't let this go, we gotta get up, and so she, marches off to the prime minister's office and she says, I want to see the prime minister. And her people are saying, you can't just walk up to the prime minister's office. You just can't go in and see him. She says, I'm going to go see him. We have to have this deal. <clears throat> and so the prime minister says, I can't see her because I can't say no to this lady. And her foreign minister, Natwar Singh, is saying, the lady's standing outside. You've got to let her in. You can't just make her stand outside. And so he's, he's like wringing his hands and saying the, to the prime minister, you can't just leave Condi Rice outside. And he's, she's come from President Bush. And so he says, let her in, let her in. So there's this whole thing going on in the Indian like room inside. And they're all like, they don't know what to do with her. So she finally gets led inside and this very soft-spoken prime minister and she says, Prime Minister, this is a historic opportunity. You can't let this go. We're all in this room. The president is here. You have to have this deal. And he doesn't know how to say no to her. So anyway, long story short, they conclude the deal. Both the prime minister and the president work it out. But it was sort of like this. You know, they'd, they'd come to the thing. Everything would fall apart. And then the prime minister and the president would like fish it out of the water and, and solve the whole problem. But, but it went like that. And then right at the end, you know, the, and, and, and everyone in Washington was going crazy because they were in their second term. And, and they were thinking, we've got one legislative session left. What are we going to do? And they come back to Congress because Congress was saying, we haven't been told about this. You just negotiated what with the Indians? We have 30 years of a nuclear policy where India is supposed to not be allowed any of this, and you just negotiated that you were going to allow India all this? What are you thinking? So this was a massive thing. Remember, the Iraq war was, you know, Bush was like being lambasted for the Iraq war. Congress was divided about Afghanistan. So the fact that they managed to get this whole India exception through Congress unanimously was really quite a feat. And um, they called the whole Indian community, and by, by now the Indian diaspora was pretty strong, and they told the Indian diaspora, the Indian ambassador called in all the Indians and said, all these wealthy Indians, and said, go out and call all your congressmen and tell them to help us. So they held fundraisers, and they gave money to the senators and the congressmen, and they were like, we really need the two countries to cooperate. We want you to help us. So, you know, please vote for this thing. So everyone was tapped. Everyone was called in. And so um, this whole thing was a massive effort. And, and then it got passed in Congress. So then Manmohan Singh goes, to Parliament, and he thinks, oh, Parliament is, is going to be fine with it because no one's raised any objections. And you won't believe it. No one in the opposition thought they would, that the Americans would ever sign off on it. They said, there is no way the Americans are going to sign off on 30 years. I said, they've had this policy in place for 30 years. They're never going to give India this exception. So then they'd never raised any issue. All of a sudden, Manmohan Singh comes bearing this diamond and says, we got the deal and wants to pass it in, in parliament and the opposition like flips and thinks, oh my gosh. And they said, 
And the opposition says, no, we're all going to resign. And his, the coalition, coalition says, we're going to pull your support. And all of a sudden, they almost bring down the Indian government over this deal. So now the Indians can't pass it through their parliament. So anyway, to make a long story short, the government almost fell. And, and now the Indians can't get it through their parliament. And so now they're in, Bush is in his, almost his last term in office. And he, he in, in his last month, and, and they're calling the Indians saying, you better get this done because Obama's going to come in, and I can tell you he's anti-nuclear. He's not going to want to give you this deal. So if you want to do this deal, you got to do it now. And finally, the prime minister goes to Sonia Gandhi and says, I will offer you my resignation if you don't support this. And somehow, I won't get into the story, but it's in the book, they managed to get it through parliament. But, the, but based on the fact that the prime minister offers to resign, I think the thing to remember is and that both democracies struggled really hard, hard yeah. to break this paradigm. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't it as if done. the Americans you know, did extra hard work. On the Indian side, it was a coalition government. Uh, th there were left parties that saw America absolutely as a, you know, f they were against the, the US. Communist party, yeah. That's yeah. Them, yeah. So they, uh, were part of the coalition government, and without their support, Manmohan Singh couldn't, you know, get it through. So that struggle went on for about eight months in New Delhi. Well, they pulled their support and, and they had to line uh, with someone else. Then finally, yeah. uh, the prime minister said, I'm just going to go ahead. He uh, told Sonia Gandhi, and the left parties pulled off their support the government collapsed, then there was like a vote of confidence. No confidence. Yeah, a vote of confidence which uh, the Prime Minister won. Anyway, so these, this is the good, good part of the story that the nuclear deal was done, which is absolutely a paradigm-breaking yeah. thing in the history of the two countries. But let's go back to uh, sort of so that we can tell the audience uh, some of the sources of the negativity, the suspicion, especially in the Indian mind. Um, so which US president would you say, Minakshi, um, was kind of, uh, you know, formed the negative uh, influence? And I guess Nixon comes to mind. Nixon certainly comes to mind. I mean, it's, it sort of started out actually with Dulles, John Foster Dulles, who, um, you know, was very much of the ilk, he hated neutrality, he thought it was immoral. Um, and when he came to India, he irritated everyone and he also concluded the very first defense deal with Pakistan. And so that um, alienated everyone in India. Um, Eisenhower was fairly popular because he reached out to Nehru, that, that helped things a bit. But that was right at the end of his uh, right at the end of his presidency. But Nixon, Nixon had come when Eisenhower when he was Eisenhower's vice president to India, and he um, he had met with Nehru, and Nehru thought that they had had a good philosophical discussion, and that they had had an understanding of India's issues and uh, geopolitical issues. But then Nixon goes off and gives a press conference and basically um, is very negative about India. He did not take to Nehru personally, but he hit that very well. And he ab actually just uh, gave a press conference where he denigrated India and Nehru. He thought Nehru was an arrogant man, full of himself, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, Mrs. Gandhi, who was present with her father, was his hostess at the time, um, never forgot this insult. When she became prime minister and Nixon was president, um, as, as Kissinger once put it, they were never meant to be friends. And Kissinger said that Mrs. Gandhi was not among the people that Nixon liked. 
um, they could not stand to be in the same room with each other. Um, it was like oil and water. They, they just hated each other. And um, I, I tracked through a lot of the letters to find out what was the basis of this enmity. And sometimes, you know, it's politics and sometimes things are very personal. And Nixon was very thin-skinned. He took insults very personally. And in the same way that Mrs. Gandhi took this very personally, uh, the way he denigrated India and the father, and she never forgot, um, Nixon came to India and Pakistan. He did an Eastern tour when he was out of office. Um, and he, he came to India, and she was very dismissive of him. Uh, they were sitting in a room and they were having a conversation and I discovered through some letters and things that um, she turned to her secretary, looked at her watch very obviously and basically in, in Hindi turned around and said to him, how long do I have to, you know, sit here with him? And he did not understand, but he suddenly got the gist of what she was saying, and he was very insulted. And she basically pushed him out of the room and onto her next appointment, kind of thing. He got to, yeah, he got to, he got to Pakistan, and he was treated like a king. They rolled out the red carpet. They they gave him uh, the same treatment as they would to an acting head of state. Well, she never forgot it. Uh, then all of a sudden, um, there's. There's this, uh, Nixon wants to go to China, and Pakistan becomes a conduit. And he totally ignores the fact that Pakistan's in the middle of a civil war. He opts to um, support um, Pakistan's, Pakistan and its, uh, in the civil war. And thousands and thousands of refugees are coming into India. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi appeals to the world to support uh, the Bangladeshi side, the, the American ambassador in Bangladesh has made it very clear to the world that there's a genocide happening and there's a sort of problem within the State Department between um, you know, what Kissinger wants to do in terms of protecting Pakistan because he's using the Pakistanis to reach China and what's happening in Bangladesh. There's a split in the, in the State Department. Uh, Nixon's very angry that the State Department, uh, that the, that the uh, embassy in Bangladesh is creating these, these waves. Um, and Mrs. Gandhi latches onto that. She, she takes the Pakistani side, there's a war, everyone knows the history. Um, she was on the right side of history and um, they, they, they win the war against the Pakistanis. And Nixon just can't, Nixon and, and Kissinger just, just can't forgive her for, for this. Um, and, and they think that this was personal, they, it was vindictive, it was, undoing, it was done to undermine Yahya Khan. She sees this, that this was inevitable, it was, a humanitar it was done from a humanitarian standpoint. Of course, India benefited because it didn't constantly want to be threatened on two fronts, but nevertheless, it was the right, uh, the right call at the time. So uh, Pakistan comes into existence and, and uh, I mean, Bangladesh comes into existence and uh, they, um, the, the rest is history. But, the relations between the U.S. and, and uh, India really take a nosedive because um, they, just, they just basically collapse after this. And that was probably the worst they've ever been. They just, they just take a while to recover after that. Right. Uh, this was a time that the U.S. sent the they also, yes, they also did something really pretty serious, which is um, Nixon, who, I mean, uh, Kissinger, who we all, who has portrayed himself as a diplomat of the century, actually, if you read Haldeman's diaries, uh, he does not come across as the diplomat of the century. He comes across as sort of conniving, and he's always trying to undermine the Secretary of State, Rogers. He comes across as petty. 
um, and, and somewhat unstable, according to Haldeman and Nixon. Um, and and um, he, he actually, not only did he order the USS Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal, which was almost an act of a declaration of war, but he actually tried to uh, provoke the Chinese or to push the Chinese into opening up a third front uh, against India at the time. The Chinese sensibly didn't, um, didn't do it, but he um, tried to escalate the crisis. So right. Mrs. Gandhi really just thought that they were, that they were evil. Even the ambassador, American ambassador in Delhi at the time, Keating, were wondering what the State Department, what, what, what Kissinger was up to and, and thought that they were playing a really dangerous game. In short, uh, we don't like Nixon and Kissinger, we can say. <laughs> Not in India. So, um, uh, I think in America also it's uh, pretty uniform. Uh, let's jump, I think this is a good point to jump to the present time, and, um, and especially because of the opening to China that uh, Nixon created. Uh, now they say, that China is America's biggest rival today. Uh, they say that the 21st century is going to be an Asian century, and the Indo-Pacific region uh, will be the most dynamic region of the world. Uh, the US has reactivated a grouping called the Quad, uh, which involves the US, India, Australia, and Japan, to band together uh, and to signal to China that it cannot run roughshod over other countries. Um, so I want to ask Ambassador Juster, uh, you saw the U.S. Indo-Pacific uh, policy get fleshed out when you were ambassador. Um, tell us uh, how, uh, what, what the U.S. was thinking, uh, what is the strategy behind it? Okay, well, <coughs> thank you. Uh it certainly was fleshed out over the last five or six years, the overall relationship, and <clears throat> despite what one may have in terms of their broader view of uh, President Trump and his histrionics, he actually was very popular in India uh, for a variety of reasons and accomplished a lot during his period of time that has been continued very strongly with the Biden administration. I think he, he, he was popular because he was uh, a president who spoke out against cross-border terrorism from Pakistan, who recognized the challenge that the rise of China presented to India and put forward policies uh, in that regard. The Quad is one that is mentioned. Uh, and who also, despite a reputation for being transactional, was actually very uh, magnanimous toward India, both in making India uh, qualified for what was called strategic trade authorization tier one, which gave them special access to U.S. technology without anything uh, in return. And then, as we may discuss later, when China turned on India in the northern border in 2020 and amassed 50,000 troops and heavy artillery and actually moved into Indian territory, uh, the United States uh, tr provided tremendous uh, assistance to India. And a lot of that grew out of developments that had occurred on the ground over the previous uh, four years. In the defense area, for 10 years, we had been trying to negotiate what were called foundational agreements that would provide more information sharing, geospatial information, intelligence information uh, to India, secure communications between the two countries, industrial cooperation. These were concluded. Uh, over the course of 2017 to 2020. Uh, in addition, the trade and investment relationship continued to grow. In my opinion, it's not where it should be, but it continued to grow, which creates greater ballast to the overall uh, partnership between the two countries. In the energy area, there was much more U.S. energy provided to India in all areas, whether it was coal, oil, liquefied natural gas, or renewables that increased in India's energy security. Uh, there were military exercises that were ramped up. They were not only single service, but tri-service exercises, and f exercises not just with the United States and India, but we expanded them to Japan and Australia as part of this quadrilateral uh, grouping. 
for the first time we stationed personnel at each other's military uh, headquarters. So a lot of things occurred on the ground, but then strategically, and this is very important, the whole concept of the Indo-Pacific, which had been broached by Prime Minister Abe of Japan in 2007, and there had been a initial effort for India, Japan, Australia, and the United States to work together on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, but the Chinese had quickly expressed their displeasure for such a grouping, and it disbanded in 2008. Well, there was a major initiative put forward while I was ambassador to revitalize this quad grouping, and we began it first at the working level, but in 2019, we had the first ministerial among the four countries at the uh, foreign minister or secretary of state level, uh, and we also had uh, begun trilateral summit meetings with Japan, United States, and India. And then we had a second ministerial of the Quad during COVID, but it was in person in October 2020. So these were very important in terms of starting to create habits of working together in cooperation uh, among these countries. In addition, we began what is known as the two plus two, which were strategic meetings with the foreign ministers and the defense minister, and, or, or in our country, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, to discuss major strategic issues, including how to manage the rise of China. India has now taken this two plus two concept and uses it in meetings with Japan. They just had their second two plus two with them and with Australia. But we had a two plus two every year, including again in 2020 during COVID, when the U.S. Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense traveled in person uh, to India in October. Uh, and so when you look at those ideas, that was really a strategic shift uh, uh, in terms of the overall region that the Biden administration has followed through on and elevated. The Quad grouping is now conducted at the leadership level. Uh, President Biden began that very early in his term, uh, and there have been several meetings of the four leaders of the country. They have continued the whole concept of the Indo-Pacific and have at the National Security Council a coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs, and they have increased the two plus two uh, dialogue. So we have many challenges ahead, but all of this has been elevated, and uh, China's uh, increased aggressiveness and expansionist activities have given further impetus to some of these strategic groupings. The next five to 10 years are gonna be very fluid in this region and how the region does respond to China's rise, how these groupings get together, what are the limitations, because the United States, Australia, and Japan are treaty allies. India is only a strategic partner with these countries. Does that pose limitations or not? We may get into some of that. Uh, but overall, this has really continued to elevate the relationship and flesh it out in a strategic way. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for giving us this perspective. And China is really the challenge that is the driving force uh, in bringing us together. Although uh, we still differ, as you know, uh, in terms of the war in Ukraine, India hasn't taken um, a pro-West stand. It is not sanctioning Russia. It has caused some friction. Um, uh, at the top level, but I would say the relationship has grown strong enough over the years that uh, we can talk to each other and sort our differences and the Americans are more understanding of Indian compulsions um, and India is a little more understanding of American uh, compulsion. It's, uh, you know, U.S. relations with Pakistan continue to uh, cause some disturbance in the relationship with India, just as India's relations with Russia cause disturbances um, in U.S.-India relations. So with that, um, we should invite our audiences to ask questions if anyone uh, would like to ask the ambassador or Minakshi Emma, the author. Um, anything on your mind? Uh, th hang on, we'll uh, give you please this. wait for the microphone Sorry. to come to you. Yeah. I was excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Ambassador Ken, we talked about the past and this, the journey of Indo-US relationship, but I want to know about the future and the present. 
he was in a indian administration uh, he was in india throughout trump administration free trade deal agreement was a talk of lutians delhi when president trump was in india when he got a extravaganza welcome with the namaste india uh, namaste trump but it seems like fta is on slow burner do we need another republican administration to move further in this process as india is going to finalizing the trade deal with the uh, uk by this diwali when there is another diwali coming with us india trade agreement thank you okay uh, thank you the question focuses on the us india trade and investment relationship uh in in the overall partnership one of the key pillars is the economic relationship uh, our high tech communities have both been in engines that have dr driven the two countries closer together indian americans and have played a key role in the us uh, technology sector but trade and investment while it has continued to go up and increase has never been in my opinion at the level it should be given the size of our two countries the united states the largest economy in the world india's the fifth largest economy and we've made efforts to improve that but it still has hit road barriers and uh, i think that's a real challenge going forward because i think as important as the relationship is it needs always needs to have additional ballast and increased economic ties gives ballast to that relationship during the administration i was in well when i began as under secretary of commerce in 2000 we had about 19 billion dollars of bilateral trade when i left in 2020 we had hit 150 billion or so and maybe now it's at 165 maybe 170 billion dollars but as i said it's far short of what it should be the challenge is that china has a strong economic strategy for the region it has a lot of bilateral trade i think leading bilateral trader with virtually every country in asia it has uh, joined the regional comprehensive economic partnership or regional agreement that india had been negotiating to be a part of but withdrew at the last minute the other regional agreement known as the trans pacific partnership the united states had originally been a signatory but abruptly withdrew uh, when president trump was in office something that i think was a huge strategic mistake and so we've really opened up the playing field for china to dominate Uh, China also has what's known as a Belt and Road Initiative that has uh, enabled it to provide funding for infrastructure projects and connectivity uh, throughout Asia. And there have been fits and starts in the U.S.-India effort, but right now politically trade is sort of a negative subject in both countries. And while India has concluded recently trade agreements with Australia and with the United Arab Emirates and is discussing them with the United Kingdom and Canada. they still are not comprehensive agreements they are targeted in certain areas uh, and the united states and india discuss the possibility from time to time of a bilateral agreement but they're not moving that forward i really think they've got to focus on the digital area this is key to both countries the digital economy right now they're not talking uh, very much about that but setting the standards and norms for what's going to happen in terms of digital trade is critical I think they need a regional strategy because if China dominates Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, that's going to have huge geopolitical impacts as well. So it's an area that I think is important to develop. There's a lot that exists. There are over 2000 American companies that operate in India, but it's a difficult environment and India has the US as its number one trading partner, but it still should lock that in with some sort of trade agreement so it's been a disappointment uh it's a positive story i had a, my commercial counselor always said it's never been better theoretically that's right each year it's better than the year before but it's never fulfilled its potential as well so it's one of the challenges that we have uh, going forward how to make our two vibrant economies at a time i'll just conclude of almost increased economic nationalism you see a lot of countries coming out of covid saying we really need to be more reliant on what we can do internally uh but we also and one of the things the quad is doing is working on efforts to at least among trusted partners have resilient supply chains work on critical and emerging technologies so we have to find areas where we can work together 
and build up the relationship. No country can be fully self-reliant or self-sufficient and do it on its own. It needs to not necessarily go to every place around the world that's the lowest cost place for inputs, but to have trusted partners that you can work with and rely on to diversify some of your supplies and not be vulnerable. And it's a huge area of challenge and opportunity. Yes, please. This is a public forum, and you may be constrained, Ambassador Jester, but what do you and maybe all three of you think of the sliding of democratic norms in India for the last few years, particularly minority rights? And can you speak about it with some candor? Uh, look, I think the greatest strength of both the United States and India is its democratic form of government and the diversity of its population and the pluralistic char character of its societies. And when we draw on the best of that, we are at our strongest internally and externally in the, in the message we send to the world. As I said, one of the things that brought the US and India together in 2000, 2001 was the simple notion that we're both democracies and we should have better relations. Uh, when there are threats to that internally, when there are practices that uh, lead to discriminatory behavior or attacks on minority populations, I think that weakens us internally and sends a very poor message externally uh, when other countries look at us. There are certainly challenges that are occurring uh, in both countries. Uh, and we need to figure out ways to deal with those in constructive manners. When you're an ambassador uh, or in uh, diplomatic relations, you have to decide is the best way to deal with an issue that troubles you privately or publicly. Uh, and my own view is that as, as in with any country, when you chastise it publicly, that makes it more difficult for the country to address the issue because they don't want to look like they're responding because they're being uh, told to do so by another country. At the same time, if an issue gets bad enough, a country has uh, an obligation to speak out in a parallel area. Uh, I just saw uh, yesterday in the news that Prime Minister Modi for the first time has spoken out against Russia on uh, the war in Ukraine because, in my view, the atrocities in that war have gotten so extreme that even though India has a long uh, and complex relationship with Russia, at some point, and, they, and Prime Minister Modi has had numerous private conversations with uh, President Putin, at some point, the behavior has become so egregious that you have to say, look, this war has to, has to stop. And so every administration uh, whether it's India versus the United States, United States versus India, has to figure out how do you best express concerns you may have about what's occurring domestically. Is it best in candid private conversations? You have to understand the complicated situations. Uh, uh, or at some point do you uh, speak publicly? And you see the Biden administration trying to manage that balance uh, it, itself. I'll just add that um, historically, if you look back at history, what has really um, differentiated India amongst this whole landscape of dictatorships, military uh, coups, and communist regimes has been that it's been a democratic power. And even though India's had a prickly relationship with the US over the last, you know, since when in the beginning, particularly the first 50 years, what always persuaded Congress to help India and to give it military aid was the fact that it was not just a democracy because there are a lot of people that have elections but are illiberal democracies, but it had freedom of the press and that it you know, had a multicultural secular society. So um, even under Truman and under you know, Eisenhower and those, all those early years, even though people said, well, India doesn't vote with us at the UN, what does India do to, for us? I mean, a lot of Congress people would say, why should we give India aid? They were always persuaded by this one argument. And so 
India was always supported. Um, Kennedy used to make that, that argument very strongly in India's favor, that India is the front line against communist aggression and particularly against communist Chinese aggression. So I think, uh, and, and President Bush, H -W, uh, not H.W., President uh, Bush too, he said that he was very big on democracy and he's the one who said, we have to make India into an ally because basically they're like us. So I think that um, India, India being a democracy, having a free press, having you know, elections, having, um, you know, having a secular constitution, I think those things do matter to the Americans. I couldn't agree more. I think there's a kind of social churning going on in India that gives people like me who grew up at a certain time in India where secularism was our, you know, anthem. Um, it gives us pause. Um, I just hope that the structures that we have in place are strong enough uh, to keep, uh, you know, those in power uh, be reminded that it's a diverse country, uh, it's, uh, that's its most important aspect and its strength. Because uh, if India weakens because we are fighting with each other or one group of people is setting upon the other groups, uh, it's not going to be much help. We cannot be the leading power, which is the stated goal of the government. So with that, I think... I just had one more thing. Gopal Gandhi said something very nice this morning, that the preamble to our constitution was justice. Justice for all. We should remember that. I'm, I'm not sure if this will fit, but I'm curious back to when uh, after 30 years of uh, locking India out with sanctions um, and that campaign went on raising prominent Indians to uh, promote their people in Congress to pass that exception. I wonder what else happened in Congress. Is that part of your book and what trade-offs had to be made to get that? If you could just repeat your question or clarify it a bit, I didn't quite get it. You mean because of the sanctions, there might have been some trade-offs on Capitol Hill? When, um, when Indians were promoted, Indians living in the US, prominent Indians to um, lobby their uh, people in Congress to pass to, uh, for this, this exception to allow nuclear yes. technology and, uh, and other technology into India. Um, what other trade-offs had to be made in Congress? Does anybody know that? Well, there weren't really any trade-offs. They just- things that got tagged on to bills, that kind of thing. Oh, no, they didn't have any tag. They, they, nothing was tagged on. They weren't like, you mean like pork barrel stuff? No, there weren't any pork barrels. Uh, th this was just a straight off. Um, this was just straight, pretty straightforward. Ken, Ken might have more. Yeah, I, I would just add that, as I was saying earlier, there was not at the outset a broad consensus on the importance of the U.S.-India relationship, and in part, passing the legislative requirements that were necessary for the United States to provide civil nuclear technology to India in many ways brought the Congress together in a way that had not previously existed. And it was for a variety of reasons. One of them was the increasing importance of the Indian American diaspora in the United States as a political force. And they were able to effectively explain to their members of Congress why it was important for our two countries to work together and why this exception should be made for India, which was not a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, and it took a while. None of this happened easily or quickly. Uh, and it took a lot of meetings among 
members of the Indian government, Sham Saran was a big player in this, up on Capitol Hill, the ambassador at the time, uh, Ronan Sen. And eventually what came out was a growing consensus on the Hill of the importance of the relationship, and now one of the strongest parties that are people, group of people that are proponents of the U.S.-India relationship are the members of Congress, and the largest caucuses are the Indian caucus in the Senate uh, and the House that relate to uh, foreign countries. Uh, but this is also a group of people that felt one of the important aspects of the relationship was that we were two democracies, and so you have members of Congress that are very outspoken when they feel there are uh, actions that occur that undercut some of the shared values between our two countries. If um, I think I can give a more journalistic answer that she's looking for. <laughs> Might be more interesting also. So there were some un, uh, sort of declared quid pro quos. There was an understanding that India would buy nuclear reactors uh, as a result of the civil nuclear deal uh, from the United States. That hasn't happened, much to the disappointment of the US. Another thing was, if I remember correctly, that the defense uh, market, which is dominated by the Russians in India, would open up to American companies. That did happen. Yeah. Uh, and now we buy quite a bit from the US. Uh, I think it's about $20 billion worth of uh, defense equipment and weapons that India has bought over the last 10 years. Uh, so the, 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 these are good points. I would put a little footnote on it. On the defense sales, that is something that came about as a result of the increased access to U.S. technology, and so that has been an important development, and U.S. defense sales have gone from virtually zero to over $20 billion. Uh, on the nuclear, this I, I had forgotten that, and I appreciate your raising it. There was the understanding that, in addition to the civil nuclear technology access, the U.S. would actually help construct civil nuclear plants uh, in India. But after the deal was passed, India then enacted legislation that uh, made U.S. companies liable for any problem that may occur in the construction of a, of a nuclear plant, which really is impossible for a, co a company to absorb. You have to have a national liability. And we've virtually never been able to work out some resolution of that, and there has never been yet a construction of a civil nuclear plant by the U.S. We still are in discussions on that. Uh, there's a possibility still of this occurring, but it's been a very slow and frustrating uh, situation. And it goes back to, in, in dealing with the relationship, you've got to have patience, you've got to have resilience, and you've got to see it in part as a long-term play, and the fact that over time this will build, but it doesn't happen overnight. There is a footnote to that, and it's in the book, and I won't bore you with the details, but the entire, one of the prickliest parts of the relationship had to do with the fact that um, there was an agreement based on the Indians having a nuclear power facility that was built in the 60s, and then the US reneged on the supply of nuclear fuel to that facility. I won't get into all the details now, but the Indian perspective was that they had followed the rules and the, and the US reneged on its commitment. And the US was that India broke a rule when they exploded a nuclear device. And so um, they were put into this kind of nuclear, they became nuclear pariahs. And so um, they basically froze the Indians out. And this, this became a source of contention for probably 30 years and created a lot of bad blood between the two countries. And so it's in the book, I won't get into it, but there was a reason why the Indians were hell bent on all these kind of rules and regulations at this, and why things didn't always work out. So um, there are technical details, but if you're really interested, you can read about it, but uh, it, it led to a lot of problems between the two countries. Thank you, thank you, Mina, thank you, Ambassador Justa. It's time, uh, our time has come to an end. Thank you for attending.